Your Majesty, Mr. Governor, Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it's a fantastic pleasure to be here talking to you today uh, at SLU. Uh, I do apologize that my talk is in English and uh, not in Swedish. So I want to talk about some of the real challenging issues in wildlife management today, issues that really um, make us think about how we should be dealing with these sorts of problems. So conflicts raise really important issues that resonate in society today, issues to do with democracy and trust and truth and polarization. And they also raise really strong emotions and strong passions. So I think it's very important at the start of a talk like this to have some music so that we can just stay calm and relax. And this bit of music, of course, is by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it's called Where Sheep May Safely Graze. Great. OK, we're all ready? OK, so what I'd like to do this morning is just spend a bit of time talking about the background. So what do we really mean by these conservation conflicts, wildlife conflicts? Then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges in dealing with these issues and really think about bringing examples from across the world. Think about how we can manage these sorts of conflicts and how we can move forward. So I'm going to start uh, in the highlands of Scotland. What better place to start? So it looks very like the Swedish mountains. But it's quite different in some regards. It, a, lot of these, a lot of the land is in large private estates. And these private estates are very productive for this species, the red grouse. So a lot of these estates are managed to produce red grouse for shooting. And it's an important form of land use that creates jobs um, and creates income for these um, areas. But these landscapes are also home to a variety of species of predators including this species, the hen harrier, and that's highly regarded by uh, conservation and it's heavily protected under EU legislation. But because these species predate on red grouse, many of them are illegally killed by the grouse managers. And that leads to people getting very angry about this and leads to conflict between the people who really value those species and want to protect hen harriers and those species who are protecting their livelihoods and their, and their way of life. So we have this tension and this conflict. So that just gives you one example of the sorts of issues we're facing. And let's think of another example. So let's move to a totally different system, a very unproductive system. So this is in the high Himalayas in northern India, about 4,500 metres. There's small scattered communities in this landscape that are dependent on livestock for their lives. So much of their resources are put in to livestock. But these people also share this landscape uh, with the snow leopard. This is a very beautiful species that's again highly valued by conservation. Because it's a relatively unproductive landscape, snow leopards can eat quite a lot of livestock. In fact, up to 40% of their diet can be livestock. And this can be enough, that level of predation can be enough to drive people below the poverty line. So it's an incredibly important issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, while we're uh, talking about some technical difficulties, uh, so it's an important issue and um, so it drives people below the poverty line and of course people uh, kill snow leopards in retribution. And again, we have this tension between those people who want to protect snow leopards and those people who are protecting their livelihoods. Shall we try again? So that's just two examples, but of course we also see these issues across the world in a whole suite of different places involving a whole suite of different species. But essentially those arguments are a similar thing. They're about conservation versus livelihoods or conservation versus development or conservation versus human welfare. And of course Sweden has its own glorious examples of these really challenging issues. So how should we manage these sorts of problems? So let's start off with conservation. 
and just thinking about so conservation is a place where worlds tend to clash because it's a thing conservation is a thing that people feel very passionately about the need to conserve biological diversity but of course we share this world with a whole range of other people who have maybe very different views about this who might uh, think biodiversity conservation is less important of an issue or they question the methods that conservation biologists use and the conservationists use to conserve biodiversity. So it's a place where worlds clash between conservation and development as exemplified by this figure. So let's just have a little definition. So what we're talking about really in these conflicts well, are these are situations where we have really strongly held views then so they and those views clash over conservation objectives and they clash and when there's the, and the other aspect of the conflict is when one of those parties is perceived to be asserting their interests onto the other so it could be because hunters are illegally killing wolves and the conservationists get very angry and upset about that because they feel the hunters are imposing their values onto the conservation of these species. Or it could be that conservationists may be encouraging wolves back to new areas that predate on sheep. Uh, and the farmers feel very angry and upset because conservation is imposing itself onto those farmers. So if we, we can also think about this slightly more abstractly. We have two axes where we have conservationists on the one side and livelihoods on the other side. Now, in a typical conflict, people tend to try and win the argument. So people on the conservation side are trying to maybe... <coughs> just waking you up. <laughs> just trying, uh, trying to maybe get wolves back, irrespective, in some cases, of the cost to the farmers. And of course, the farmers may be trying to have pastures that are there where their sheep can safely graze. So, the, in these typ typically in a conflict, you get these polarized positions where the people are trying to go for the win, and inevitably, then there's this clash between these two objectives. There are, of course, other potential outcomes. You can have situations where both parties may lose. Or you can have situations where both parties may win. Some of these may be a bit difficult to imagine in the, in the wolf livestock issue, but they do exist in some situations. But if we're thinking about this in terms of managing the conflict, we're really interested in this space between those four uh, outlying outcomes. So this space in here. And I guess if you're sitting on this axis, or if you're a farmer or if you're a conservationist, you have to ask yourself, should I be going for the win? Should I be trying to win the argument and get lots of wolves back and get as many wolves back as we, as we can or, or get rid of wolves completely and have lots of pastures safe for our sheep? And inevitably then live in a world where there's this tension and conflict. Or is it better to compromise a little bit and try and meet in the middle, maybe not getting as many wolves back as you originally wanted? but being able to come to some solution with the f some shared solution with the farmers. So what's the best strategy for you to employ? And those are the sort of issues that we really need to think about. How do we, how do we identify what the best strategy is in these different situations? Because it, it, these sorts of conflicts are costly and they're damaging. So in some instances, conflicts can be positive because they can stimulate and lead to change. But in many of these cases, the, the conflicts are damaging to, in some cases, life, human life, or livelihoods, or well-being. There's a variety of hidden costs. There's obviously cost to conservation. And there are costs to the relationships between individuals and the relationships between organizations that may prevent them from working together. So through my work over the last um, 10, 20 years, these, these are the sort, there are several problems and challenges to dealing with these sort of controversial issues. And these are some of the four ones that keep coming up over and over again. And I just want to spend a bit of time just talking through them. So there are issues to do with a lack of engagement. People tend to be polarized and they don't necessarily want to come together to, to communicate. There tends to be a focus on ecology. Often there's disagreement about what the evidence 
really says. And there are questions over how effective the in different interventions that are put in place are. So let's just focus on those briefly. So I just want to start with a lack of engagement. Okay, so one of the issues is that in many of these sorts of wildlife problems, we have some uh, top-down control of uh, the management of these issues. And I'm going to give a ra rather strange example. This is a dream I had two years ago. So bear with me. Okay, so I was in the south of England with Michelle Obama. And Michelle Obama said to me, Steve, because we know each other very well, and she said to me, Steve, I've just had this, uh, a donor's come up to me and given me $10 billion to set up a new network of protected areas in Africa. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. And she said, well, would you like to come and meet the donor? Because I'm off to see him now. I said, I'd love to. So we jumped in her Land Rover, and we drove down to this cave. And inside the cave, there's these doors with, um, with little signs on. And there's one door that says number 10. And we have to go and jump up and down outside this door, and then the door opens like that. And there was God. <laughs> and God was a very short Scottish woman dressed in tweed, <laughs> drinking tea. Uh, and Michelle Obama said, Steve, meet God. God, this is Steve. And I said, hi. Uh, and I said, I hear you're interested in setting up a new network of protected areas in Africa. And she said, that's right. She said, the, the current scheme is just inefficient. It's ineffective. We need to design a whole new strategy where we have much bigger areas protected that are much more closely linked together. I said, that's fantastic. But what are you going to do about the people who live in Africa in those places where you want to set up the protected area? And she said, don't worry about the people. I can move them away and make sure they have a low reproductive rate so they're not a problem. And I said, can you really do that? He said, of course I can do it. I am God. Uh, and I, at this stage, I got across in my dream, and I stormed out of the cave, and I went away. But I used that as an example of a top-down approach. Okay, And that's, although maybe it's not God that instigates it, in many cases it's a conservation movement or, uh, or even a development movement, but someone who comes in and imposes a solution on society, which is one way of dealing with these issues, but it's going to inevitably lead to tension and conflict for those people who are moved away from those areas. So that is one of the challenges, to move away from this sort of thinking to thinking about how do we actually come together and recognize this is a shared problem and we need to find the solutions that somehow bring the people and the wildlife challenges together. Another issue is that if, even if you start trying to have a dialogue, some people might not want to engage. They want to fight. So these are a couple of quotes from uh, a meeting I was at recently in a, in a particular conflict I was working on. The time for talking is over. You know, We need to fight and we need to win and we need to defeat those people. I'm fed up with talking to them. So that is a real challenge. How do you overcome that? How do you, man how do you try and bring people together, sit around a table together? And this is where insights from psychology can really help us think about how do we try and deal with these issues. So those are two challenges, a lack of engagement. If we want to manage conflict, then we really have to engage. We have to try and develop a shared understanding of what the problem is. We have to develop a shared goal, if we can do it, and try and develop shared solutions. We tend, in these sorts of situations, to focus on the ecology. We focus on uh, maybe the impact that the predators have on the prey. We look at the, the spatial and temporal variation in the amount of predation. And in some cases, we also suggest mitigation to try and minimize that impact. So we f those are the in, the in these sorts of conflicts, those are the sorts of aspects that we focus on. To some degree, we've started exploring the attitudes, maybe the attitudes of the farmers towards wolves. But of course, we need to do much more than that. Because uh, as Henrik pointed out, you know, these conflicts, they have an important human-wildlife interaction aspect, but they also have this 
underlying conflict between humans. So if we recognize that, then we need to start thinking about these other aspects, which are things like world values, world views and core values and social norms and identity. So these are interesting things for an ecologist. I'm an ecologist, trained as an ecologist. They're interesting things for ecologists to start talking about and thinking about. So one of the challenges for us is that we can't just stay in our little silos as an ecologist and hope that we can, by ourselves, sort out these problems. We have to come together to be very problem-oriented uh, problem and to bring other disciplines together. So we need interdisciplinary teams, which is why it's fantastic for me to be in Sweden working with these brilliant people. Often in these sorts of conflicts, there's not necessarily an agreement about what the evidence suggests. And I'll give you one example. So this is an issue in the west coast of Scotland where sea eagles were reintroduced in the 1970s and 1980s, and they eat lambs. So there was concern that the impact that these predators would have on farming communities in the west coast of Scotland and there was uh, a study done in the 90s by Mick Marquis and others, and they, they basically said the predation, this, this is their conclusion from a large project, the predation of lambs by these eagles could not have been damaging to sheep farming. Great, as an ecologist, you say, right, this, we've sorted this out, um, we just need to get a bit of mitigation in place maybe, but the farmers have got nothing to worry about. But of course the farmers, have a very different perspective. So if you talk to a farmer recently, this was someone who recently uh, wrote this in, a, or was quoted as saying this in the, in the newspaper, eagles are taking 6% of my stock. So if something's not done, these eagles could actually lead to an end to hill farming in this area. So there's this huge disparity between what the science might say and what the people who have a real experience of living in these systems think so what do we do with that? Sometimes as ecologists we say, well, you're clearly ru talking rubbish. You're wrong. This is what the data show. This is what you need to listen to. You need to listen to us. We're the experts. But that does not work. Another aspect of this, this is a famous example from uh, uh, of an experiment that was done in the 70s where uh, looking at capital punishment. And they brought people together, people who are pro-capital punishment and people who are anti-capital punishment. And they collected, the researchers collected all the, the evidence from the research and they produced two dossiers. So one that summarized the evidence that capital punishment uh, was effective and one that summarized the evidence that it was ineffective. And they gave the people these two documents. And then each group became more convinced by the results that confirmed their own beliefs. Okay, and the net effect of this was, if you give people the evidence, it can actually lead to an increase in the polarization. So we have to think quite carefully about what the implications of that are for conflict research, because that's naturally what, as researchers, that's what we do. We go into a conflict, we look at the evidence, we go and do all this research, we provide the stakeholders, <coughs> with the evidence, with the ex expectation that they'll read all this evidence and then they will come to some shared understanding of what the problem is. That doesn't really work. So one of the things we might need to think about, I'm going to have to use this horrible word, transdisciplinarity. And I apologize for that, but essentially what it means is we bring the researchers together from the different disciplines with the stakeholders, with the policy makers, right from the start and we co-design the work, we co-produce the work, uh, and we co-implement the work. And the idea is if you were actually working together, thinking about what the problem is, what the alternative hypotheses might be, collect the data together and interpret it together, people have got buy-in and they recognize and understand the evidence together. Nice idea, we don't really know whether it, it works, but it's uh, something that we should really be striving for, I think, at least to see if it to try and test it. And then lastly, just want to touch very briefly on this uh, issue of, um, which sort of follows on from those previous three concerns 
interventions are often ineffective. So if we've got a wolf issue, we might suggest having more fences, better fences, or we might suggest some sort of lethal control of individuals or compensation or increasing the number of guard dogs in flocks or increasing the numbers of shepherds. All these sorts of solutions we might suggest. And invariably, it's the researchers and or the policy makers who choose which of these types of approaches we should be following. And they don't really, in many cases, they don't really talk to the stakeholders about how they feel about having these solutions imposed on them. So how acceptable are those different solutions for the stakeholders? Because if the stakeholders don't buy into that idea, that approach, then they're much less likely to implement it later on. In addition, the effectiveness of these different interventions is often not rigorously tested. So we don't really go out and test the effectiveness uh, in many cases. That's not always true, but in many cases we don't really test the effectiveness of these different approaches. And we tend to focus on the impact. We focus on the ecology and we sort of forget this human dimension. So we're not thinking about the interventions we need to put in place to reduce the conflict. So we need to think about interventions that are ecologically effective, but are also critically acceptable to the stakeholders, uh, interventions that reduce conflict. And ultimately, try and find and explore interventions that are going to lead to better social outcomes and better conservation outcomes. Okay, I'm just going to give you three different examples from the field uh, in various different studies. First of all, I wanted just to make the point, although I've talked about some of the challenges of taking a very top-down approach, it is worth pointing out that a bit of top-down pressure can make quite a big difference. So this is an example from uh, goose hunting in Denmark. And there was concern about the level of injury that uh, the geese in the wild were having. So a lot of geese were being shot but not killed, and they were flying around with lead shot. And the minister in Denmark got very involved in this and got very upset. And uh, so he brought the hunters together and he said, well, you've got eight years. I'm going to give you eight years to try and sort this problem out. And if you don't sort it out in eight years, I'm going to shut you down. So we'll ban goose shooting in Denmark. And lo and behold, if you Im impose that sort of pressure, things change. So the, so the level of... Uh, injury that these geese were carrying declined rapidly over eight years. So a bit of top-down pressure can stimulate a bit of activity. But of course it's more complicated than that. Um, and this is an example of uh, how a very different approach can be also be very effective. So this is another conflict. So this is a conflict, um, and I think we see a similar thing in the Baltic, conflict between fishermen uh, and seal conservation. Some people want to have seals, some people want to have salmon. So the, the evidence that uh, was available suggested that salmon form a fairly small part of the seal diet, and that the impact of seals on the salmon populations is probably pretty small, but the perception amongst the fishermen was that the impact was pretty significant, uh, or at least moderate. So this uh, perception led to the fishermen going out and shooting seals. So there's this big conflict between the conservationists and the fishermen. And eventually this guy, Butler, came out of the fishing uh, community and he said, we need to try and do something about this. So he was instrumental in setting up uh, an, uh, what's what they called an adaptive co-management plan. Okay, so it was an adaptive um, management, but it was bringing together the stakeholders and the researchers and the policy makers to try and restore the conservation status of these species, to try and reduce the shooting of seals and look and explore ways of reducing seal predation on salmon. And it was highly effective. So the plan led to a shared understanding. There was agreement about what the evidence suggested. There was ultimately reduced shooting. There was intensive research to try and identify individual seals that might be causing problems. 
and importantly, there was reduced conflict. So people in this conflict developed this plan and as a pro part of that process of being in that plan, they were more relaxed about how the system was being managed. So by coming together and having that debate and that discussion and that uh, um, developing that, co-developing that knowledge, it led to a reduction in conflict. And I'm going to lastly go back to snow leopards. So again, a reminder, we have this conflict between people who, want to, who need livestock for their lives and people who want to have snow leopards in the landscape. And I've been working with the, the Snow Leopard Trust in these, in these systems, and they work in these systems um, by developing long-term engagement. So they've been working for maybe 10, 15 years with these communities to really focus on developing and building trust with the communities and negotiating the solutions to shared, to recognizing this is a shared problem. So that they go into communities and say, we want to have snow leopards in this landscape, but we recognize these predators are an important problem for you. So are there ways that we can manage this system that would allow us to have snow leopards and would allow you to have your livestock with minimal losses? And then they might suggest um, building corrals to reduce the losses. They might suggest insurance programs or they might suggest handicraft schemes where if the communities are interested in, in joining these schemes, then uh, they can produce predator-friendly handicrafts which then can be for sale in an international market. One of the critical things about this approach is that it's about the communities themselves taking ownership. So it's not about a conservation organization going in, throwing money at it. It's about building relationships and supporting those communities uh, to develop those schemes and take ownership of those schemes. And at least the initial data suggests that this is very effective. So the communities are, are keen on taking ownership of those ideas. There's reduced livestock loss, there's increased household income, there's a real change in the, in the attitudes towards the species and towards the, uh, the projects. And there's been no detectable retribution killing in those communities um, which we're engaged with. But that's just five communities. We're now in a, in a situation where we're exploring that across 50 different communities in India and China and Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan and Pakistan to look at the cultural differences and how these sorts of approaches might be effective. And what, they, what those approaches might teach us about how we deal with conflicts in the UK or how we deal with conflicts in Sweden. Okay, so what I wanted to do at the end of this talk was to try and bring all that together in a, in a framework for uh, thinking about and dealing with these issues. So we start off with uh, a conflict. Okay, and the first thing we might want to do to think about how do we manage this conflict is to map it out. Okay, so we might need to think about who the stakeholders are that are involved in these issues, um, what the context is that those conflicts are in, uh, um, the, what's the landscape that those conflicts are being played out on, the social, uh, the ecological, the economic, for example. We need to collect all that evidence together and then we have a better understanding of uh, of what that issue is. And then we're in, a we're in a position where we can ask whether the stakeholders want to engage. And they might not want to engage. They might say, no, we want to fight. In which case you're going to end up in the conflict. Or potentially a solution might be imposed on one of those groups and you end up with uh, one party or maybe both parties losing. If the stakeholders do want to engage, then you can start thinking about process. What sort of dialogue process do you put in place? Who are the stakeholders who need to be involved in, that so in those sorts of discussions? How do you make decisions? Do you involve uh, independent facilitators, independent mediators? What role does government play? All those sorts of things, which is, of course, where Camilla comes in, which is where political scientists come and guide us into thinking about what we need to think about. If we can identify the appropriate process, then we can start exploring the, the evidence base and then we ask, are there stakeholders, stakeholders willing to negotiate? Are they will, willing to sit down and argue about how we manage this 
you know, or are they just going to defend their original position? If they're just defending their original position, then essentially you're back in conflict and you're just standing up talking to each other. But if they are willing to uh, debate and uh, engage, then you can start exploring and testing mitigation techniques and seeing if those solutions are adopted. So it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Uh, because it is complicated. And I like to show this because it shows it's non-linear, so you can be up here, you think you're about to find a solution, and then maybe someone does something illegal and the press pick up on it, and there's a big argument, and, and you find yourself, people pull out of a dialogue, and you find yourself back in the conflict. The other bit to point out, of course, is there's lots of different colors here. So there's some green, there's a lot of red, there's quite a lot of blue. And essentially what that says is comes back to this issue that if we want to cha tackle these sorts of problems, we need a variety of different skills. So we can't just do it in a single discipline. We have to find a way of developing interdisciplinary approaches and developing those approaches with the stakeholders and with the policy makers. I think it's just important at the end just to say you know, these conflicts can be really uh, painful to live with and very emotional, and uh, but they can be managed. So this is a conflict that I grew up with uh, in the background of my childhood in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and it just seemed interminable. As conflict over Northern Ireland, it was horrible. So this was a bomb that went off near where my wife lived, and this was in 1993. Killed two boys, injured lots of people. And at that time, we just felt this thing was never going to be managed. It was just never going to be dealt with. But of course, at the same time as the bomb was going off, there was all this hidden dialogue between the different parties involved in that conflict in Northern Ireland and between the parties and the British government. And ultimately, that led to the Downing Street Agreement, which led to the fragile peace that we see today. So I would say it's a good example of uh, conflict management. It's not the conflict hasn't been resolved. You know, the conflict is still there and it has the potential to bubble up and turn violent again, but it's being managed at the moment. So I think it's important to take a positive message in these very con uh, contentious and challenging issues and think, you know, we can make a difference. We can move the situation from being quite intense conflict to being carefully managed. So, just to summarize, I would say conflicts can be managed. I wouldn't call it a conflict resolution. I don't think we can resolve these issues, but we can learn to manage them. But they do require long-term investment. They require long-term investment in conflict management, not just in ecology or not just in trying to uh, look at mitigation, we need to think about it holistically. And we need to consider both the human wildlife and the human-human dimensions. Linking the research, the academic disciplines with the policy makers and the stakeholders. Then the process we put in place must be fit for the context in which it's faced with. So it's not, you can't have one process that's going to fit all different conflicts across the world. They need to be fit for purpose. We need to be able to co-produce the evidence uh, and agree and set the goals that we're striving for. And we need leadership. And that doesn't necessarily mean leadership just from government. It means leadership from the research community. It means leadership from the policy makers and leadership from within the stakeholder group. So we need to be encouraging that form of leadership. And ultimately, these things are about recognizing our shared humanity. Because we have these two, often the two or more groups that are very polarized. And you see when, when you have a conflict that people start to see each other as the other group there, you know, the, the group that we don't want to talk to, we don't want to engage with. So we need to recognize and try and break down those barriers and recognize the humanity on both sides, whether it's a group of uh, conservationists and a group of farmers who don't communicate with each other. We need to have empathy. We need humility. 
Uh, and I often find in my research that whiskey is particularly useful in this, and as, in, as is humor. So it's a fantastic opportunity for me to be here to work with these great people and to look at really how we can bring political science and environmental psychology and ecology together to really start to dig into these conflicts and think about how we can effectively manage them. Thank you very much.